Destiny is not so much a war or this uh, U.S. land grab, but we're going to just simply look at some of the westward migrations and what that implies for the inhabitants that are already in the West, or namely the Indians. Uh, as always, these notes are available on the class materials page, and something new this time, uh, we're not going to concentrate on, this, on the small, significant, minute details, but we're going to look at the broad spectrum here and then come back and look at those details in class. So let's get going. So what is Manifest Destiny exactly? Um, well, like I've told you in class before, it was this concept that Americans thought that they had this need to expand to the Pacific Ocean and Mexican territory, that the U.S. were supposed to do this because it was a God-given right to spread democracy west. And many Americans just simply want to expand or want to move west. Now, there are several reasons for moving west besides it just being simply God's providence or God's will that Americans move west. Some of these reasons are just practical. A fresh start. Uh, maybe they couldn't find land in the east. Maybe it was too expensive. And the promise of a new land out west, a new frontier, seemed like a good place to start anew. There was abundance of land out in this, segment, uh, out in this section of the United States. Farming was available. Uh, speculation was also available. And then, eventually... As you saw with the, uh, as in the case of San Francisco, gold. Uh, the prospect of gold is going to draw a lot of people out there. Now, there are practical trade reasons as well. Transportation revolution led to an increased trade with Asia, and California is just a natural, close proximity to Asia in order to trade. So that's uh, a very conventional way to increase trade and increase money. Uh, new harbors in the Oregon Territory are going to help expand this trade with Asia, primarily in China and in Japan. Now, like I said before, uh, what's already in the West? Well, namely the Indians. They had been moved out there before, uh, primarily thanks to the United States. So you've got more and more settlers heading West. Indians are already out there. And so what do you do with them? Obviously, the, a lot of Americans want this new land. Some of these Indians are simply going to assimilate. We've seen this situation before where Indians just become more like white men. They adopt white culture. They become Christians. And they pretty much just become run-of-the-mill everyday Americans, despite the fact that they're not white. There is pressure on a lot of the tribes that don't want to assimilate to move farther west, even farther west of the Mississippi than they already were. Some of these tribes are going to choose to fight back. Uh, this is going to lead eventually to one of the famous Indian wars, the Black Hawk War, which takes place in 1832. In the Black Hawk War, the Illinois militia is going to defeat more than 200 solid Fox. Uh, it's pretty much just a massacre. But this massacre is eventually going to lead to a forced Indian removal or a forced Indian move even farther west of the Mississippi River. Now, an important aspect or an important relationship dealing with natives that are in the West is the Treaty of Fort Laramie, where because of all these little small fights and wars between settlers and Indians, uh, keep in mind settlers moving out West as a part of Manifest Destiny and the Indians that were already living there, the government is going to respond and try to curtail this issue. The treaty is going to be signed in 1851 in Laramie, Wyoming, which is why it bears the name of Fort Laramie, uh, and it's going to establish peace, but it also has this uh, increment that the Americans can build roads and forts in those areas that the Indians can and are allowed to settle. Because in this treaty, the Indians can receive land, uh, such as reservations, or hunting lands are promised to them. And they also are given a large amount of money. So the Indians have their land, and they give some money for allowing white settlers to live there, but it also allows Americans to build roads and forts to the areas. The Cheyenne, the Arapaho, the Sioux, the Crow, and others are going to join the United States representatives to maintain good faith and friendship in all their mutual intercourse and to make an effective and lasting peace. Um, as you could probably already tell with uh, other treaties that have been signed with Indians in the past, this one's going to fall under just as the other ones did. Now a little bit about some of the trails uh, west. One of the first significant ones is the Santa Fe Trail. Uh, it went from Independence, Missouri, to Santa Fe, New Mexico, hence its name, Santa Fe Trail. It was roughly 780 miles long. If you travel this trail, usually you worked with others that were on the trail, so you moved in groups. Uh, the main reason is because of the fear of Native Americans or the fear of Indians attacking the wagon caravans. So people usually work together in kind of communes in order to make the trip out west. Disease and alcohol is going to be introduced to Indians, again, through these trails. 
Uh, so the Indians are going to be given mass amounts of alcohol, which is going to cause all kinds of tribal problems, but also the rampant disease uh, of things we've seen in the past, such as smallpox and so on and so forth. Another one of the famous trails that took settlers out west was the Oregon Trail. Now, the Oregon Trail ran from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, Oregon. And like the Santa Fe Trail, the name of the trail carries the name of the city of its destination. So you have Oregon City, Oregon, the Oregon Trail. Now, the origin of the trail actually came from a female missionary by the name of Narcissa Whitman. And she took the trail out west with her new husband in order to set up a mission works around the fort in the new Oregon Territory. And her attempts to convert the Indians by making this trek over land and over the Rockies, her becoming the first white woman to actually cross the Rockies like this, um, by horse, sleigh, caravan, wagon. But it did ultimately prove that this trail was possible, that you could make the pilgrimage from Independence, Missouri to Oregon City, Oregon. The government is going to follow this up by building forts along the trail. Uh, why do you think that is? Mainly to protect the travelers from the Indians because conflicts were arising again. Many of the people trying to make this trail, however, are going to succumb to diseases, cholera, typhoid, dysentery, um, smallpox, things such as that will set in. And, you know, there was always the threat of the journey killing you through numerous types of accidents or an Indian raid. Now, another one of the migrations west actually centers on a religious group that came about in the early 1800s, which is known as the Mormons. The Mormons would migrate west along the Oregon Trail and then kind of dip down into Utah and what is present-day Salt Lake City, Utah. In 1830, Joseph Smith starts what is pretty much a new version or a new sect of Christianity. Uh, we know it as the Jesus Christ Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, he published the Book of Mormon, and people began to flock to this new religion. However, Smith would come under scrutiny from various, uh, from various authorities in numerous states. He's going to move the sect from New York to Illinois, and after which the sect is going to come under even more scrutiny for their practice of polygamy. Smith and his brother are going to be arrested in Illinois, and it's because of this issue of polygamy. And for those of you wondering, polygamy is having multiple wives. Both are going to be shot in the head over this issue in 1844. And Brigham Young is going to move the Mormons, or the followers and members of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, to Utah. And in on a little bit of bizarre history, I want to point you to something. The Donner Party. Now, like I said, a lot of these migrations west were tough, all these new territories that you have to settle. And from 1846 to 1847, the Donner Party is going to try to make their way. They're going to suffer numerous setbacks, diseases, Indian raids, and they're also going to be stuck in a blizzard. They're going to be stuck in Sierra Nevada when this blizzard happens close to New Truckee Lake. I'll show you on a map on the following slide. They're stuck in the snow. When they left for the west, they had 87 members. When they arrived, they had 48. And here's the map, and here's where they stood. Here's the Donner Camp. There's the Truckee Lake, the Breen Cabin, the Graves Reed Cabin, and the Murphy Cabin, so on and so forth. And here's where they got to get to to get back to California. Like I said, they left with over 80 members, and when they arrived, they had less than 50. If you want to know what happened to some of them, Google it. Hi, oh, Susanna, oh, don't you cry for me. I've come from Alabama with my banjo on my knee.